With the high demand of new experiences at Disney's theme parks around the world, it's always exciting to see how they keep things fresh and fun. One way they do that is by using different ride systems that complement their attractions perfectly. One of our favorite ride types are trackless ones. And today, we're going to take a look at every trackless ride at the Disney parks. What makes a ride trackless and how do they work? A trackless ride, traditionally a dark ride, consists of small ride vehicles that move along the ground without the use of rails to guide it. Early versions of the trackless rides use a wire embedded in the ground to guide the ride vehicles, such as the dark ride portion of Tower of Terror at Disney's Hollywood Studios. As technology advanced, the wire became unnecessary as ride vehicles could use RFID and Wi-Fi to determine how to navigate around the attraction. Though Disney might have the more well-known trackless attractions, they've made their way into other large parks like Efteling and small local parks like Oregon's Enchanted Forest. Remy's Totally Zany Adventure, Walt Disney Studios Park. Hold up, we're about to get in line for that ride. How long is the wait time? 15 minutes, that's the perfect time to indulge in our newest obsession. We love collecting stuff, and the Disney Collects by Tops app is an awesome way to do it. The app launched just a few months ago in honor of Mickey's 91st birthday, and it has been booming ever since with Disney fans all over the world collecting and trading our favorite characters. The app also has amazing car sets like the Enchanted Transformation series, which change shape depending on how you're holding your phone, as well as daily releases and limited time exclusives. We love getting new cards, but the fun part is trading with other Disney fans around the world because we can't get those sets complete by ourselves, and we want those awards. Their newest Billion series just dropped, and we can't wait to complete it. So if you're already using the app, go ahead and follow us. We need to trade. And if you haven't downloaded it yet, you should. It's completely free and available for iOS and Android. So download it, look for our username, follow us, and let's complete our collections together. We'll leave a link in the description. An attraction known by many names, this trackless ride takes guests on a fast-paced journey through the restaurant world of Paris, alongside Remy and his friends. The ride vehicles themselves might just be the cutest of them all, shaped to look like a round rat. It's housed in the Toon Studio area of Walt Disney Studios Park, a lane inspired by Disneyland's Toontown. Toon Studio was announced on January 11, 2005, as part of a larger plan to revitalize the entire Disneyland Paris resort, and replace the former animation courtyard. With that expansion came Crush's Coaster and Cars Quatre Rose Rally, and no doubt to the relief of the park's team, it was a success. Toy Story Land was added on August 17, 2010, the first of its kind, and included three new attractions for the area. Rumors quickly began to spread online that even more was coming to Toon Studio, including a version of Toy Story Midway Mania to be added to Toy Story Land, and a Ratatouille attraction and themed area. Though Midway Mania wouldn't come to fruition, concept art, ride blueprints, and construction photos surfaced online that confirmed a Ratatouille attraction for the Growing Tunes studio. Curiously, the construction had been ongoing for about a year, with no formal announcement by Disney. Euro Disney SCA officially announced the ride in March 2013, and it opened on July 10, 2014. Alongside its themed surrounding area, as a fun aside, the ride was originally going to be named Ratatouille Kitchen Calamity, but it may have changed as it sounded too chaotic. It might be strange to experience a typical Parisian plaza inside a Parisian park, but it only makes sense. Guests enter through the front doors of Gusteau's restaurant, but don't think about the timeline of the film. Just go with it. The queue takes you through the rooftops of Paris, where you're shrunk down to the size of a rat. After boarding your ratmobiles, you find Remy and his imaginary Gusteau trying to decide what dish they want to cook for you, their guest. The answer is obvious, ratatouille. It's easier said than done, though, as you fall through a swinging glass pane and land on the floor of the restaurant's kitchen. Remy leads you and the other rats away from the cooks. You scurry along the floor in a similar fashion as the film, making your way through a chilly icebox and under a hot oven. As you enter the dining area, you realize you've been spotted. Chaos ensues as guests notice rats in the restaurant, and Chef Skinner makes a dash to rid the building of the pest problem. Linguini is ready to help you escape to a nearby air vent. With Skinner hot on your little rat tail, it seems almost hopeless. Don't worry. You make your way into Remy's kitchen, where he's eagerly cooking ratatouille to satisfy the appetite you've surely worked up during the chase. Inside Bistro Chez Remy, you're bid farewell by the friendly rat colony and imaginary Gusto. After unboarding, why not head over to the real Bistro Cesuemi for some actual food? Just be sure not to hork it down. 
Remy's Totally Zany Adventures was an instant hit with the park guests. Not only was it designed to be placed in the Parisian Resort, but it used a fun ride system and a lot of interesting elements to keep people re-riding with each visit. The use of temperature changes inside the icebox and under the oven were a great touch. And the Dom screens really brought guests into the oversized world of a rat. It helps that the food is great too. It only makes sense that Remy would make his way into the France Pavilion at Epcot, where a clone of the attraction is set to open in summer 2020. Construction certainly seems to be moving along, and we're excited to have Remy on our side of the world. Universe of Energy, Epcot on October 1st, 1982, Epcot Center opened its gates for the first time. It was something completely different from the familiar castle parks that Disney fans knew and loved, and Imagineers took full advantage of being able to create innovative and original attractions. In Future World, the front half of the park, guests could visit pavilions that demonstrated different ways of moving into the future. Universe of Energy was a pavilion that focused on the different forms of energy used throughout the years, and how renewable energy was the next frontier. The attraction housed inside was an innovation in and of itself. The roof of the pavilion was covered in 80,000 solar cells that helped power the ride vehicles. The ride vehicles themselves were a modern marvel. They were 29 feet long and 18 feet wide, and able to hold up to 97 guests at a time. With six vehicles running per show, and two shows running at a time, the attraction had a massive capacity of almost 12,000 people. They also marked the first time Disney would use a trackless ride system in any attraction, and it was quite a challenge. The show would last around 45 minutes, and the vehicles would need to be charged multiple times throughout the day. A solution was found. Whenever the vehicles would sit in a stationary position during the show, they would be charging from underneath the floor. When guests would first enter the universe of energy, they would be welcomed into a standing theater space in front of a large screen. This screen consisted of 100 three-sided prisms that could flip in sync with the projections, giving a three-dimensional effect to the film. An eight-minute live-action presentation would be shown, which traced the various forms of energy found in nature and how people had learned to harness them. Guests were then welcomed into another theater and sat into one of six seating sections. The entire seating area would rotate 180 degrees to face three large projection screens. Another film would then play, this time a four-minute hand-animated film about fossil fuels. After this film ended, the seating area would rotate another 90 degrees to face a curtain, which would then rise to reveal a massive primeval diorama. The six seating sections broke off from each other and slowly made their way into the space. It was absolutely huge, at 32 feet high and 515 feet across, and it would take the ride vehicle 7 minutes to traverse. 36 audio animatronic dinosaurs populated the diorama, alongside a bubbling tar pit, an erupting volcano with flowing lava and a realistic smell, and 250 fabricated trees. The animatronics were so large that when they were installed, they were lowered via crane into the building, and the roof was installed afterwards. After exiting the diorama, guests would watch a 12-minute live-action film detailing the current and future energy resources being used around the world, followed by a 2-minute computer animation film depicting ways mankind has benefited from using various forms of energy. It ended with the song Universe of Energy, and after the 45-minute show is finally over, guests were sent back out into Future World to enjoy other nearby pavilions. Universe of Energy was no doubt a strange attraction that could only work in a place like Epcot. Asking guests to give up almost an hour of their time to a single attraction, especially one that involved a lot of sitting and a lot of films, was a major undertaking. That being said, it developed a following at best or gave people an air-conditioned hideaway at worst. On January 21st, 1996, Universe of Energy closed for a refurb. This would involve changing the tone of the show to something a little more upbeat, adding Ellen DeGeneres and Bill Nye into the films as narrators, and refreshing the dinosaur animatronics to reflect a more modern understanding of their appearance. In the summer of 1996, the attraction's refurb was falling behind schedule. Updates to the diorama had been implemented, but the films weren't completed. That being said, Future World East had seen the closure of World of Motion earlier in the year, and Horizons was operating sporadically. The decision was made to temporarily reopen Universe of Energy to prevent Wonders of Life from being the only pavilion open on that side of Future World in the summer. A lot of the theater effects were noticeably missing, like the rotating prisms from the first film, an Ellen DeGeneres animatronic had been installed in the primeval diorama, but it had to be covered up with temporary rock work to prevent continuity issues. After summer ended, the pavilion went down again to install the new films and prepare for its real debut. On September 15, 1996, Ellen's Energy Crisis opened to park guests for the first time. Within two weeks, the name was changed to Ellen's Energy Adventure. In this version of the attraction, a plot was created to move the guests along. 
In the first film, Ellen fell asleep watching Jeopardy and dreamt she was on an energy-themed version of the game show. Pitted up against her college rival Judy Peterson and Albert Einstein, Ellen failed miserably at answering questions. In a moment of quick thinking, Ellen called upon her friend Bill Nye the Science Guy to give her a crash course on energy history so she could beat out the other contestants. The second film showed Bill taking Ellen back into the prehistoric times to learn about fossil fuels. The curtain inside the theater would lift, sending guests into the familiar primeval diorama. The only major change was the addition of an Ellen audio animatronic, who fought off an elasmosaurus with a tree branch. The following film had Bill explaining the current energy resources being used around the world, and the final film saw Ellen jumping into the second round of Jeopardy to unseat Judy Peterson as the new champion. In 2004, Universe of Energy lost its sponsor, ExxonMobil, who had been overseeing the pavilion since opening day. Despite that, the attraction remained open and even saw a refurb from 2008 to 2009. It included updating the computer systems that controlled the ride vehicles, upgraded speakers inside the buildings, and a repaint of the building's exterior. Unfortunately, it wasn't meant to last. In 2014, the audio animatronic of Ellen DeGeneres stopped working. It was removed and replaced with a group of small dinosaurs, and never made its way back into the attraction. Attendance steadily dropped as more exciting experiences made their way into Epcot, and in July 2017, it was announced that Universe of Energy would close to make way for a new Guardians of the Galaxy attraction. Less than a month later, on August 13, 2017, Universe of Energy closed forever. During its final show, the ride vehicles ran out of battery in the middle of the primeval diorama. Guests had to be evacuated out of the building, but they were encouraged by cast members to wander around the diorama and take photos before exiting. It was rumored that cast members purposefully let the vehicles run out of charge to make this magic happen for guests, but nothing was ever confirmed. As soon as Ellen DeGeneres heard that the attraction was closing, she joked that she would love to have the animatronic of the ride for it to host her show when she wasn't there. But if anyone from Disney is watching, I want my robot back. So I have many, many uses for it. It can host my show when I'm not feeling well. It can host my show when I am feeling well. She hadn't realized that her animatronic had stopped working back in 2014 and had been removed. The animatronic was either repurposed or destroyed, but the skin and the clothes were saved, and both were bought by a Disney collector. And as a prank, the writers on Ellen's show asked to borrow the remains of the animatronic and present them to her on her birthday. Is this real? That is so offensive. That is like, like... Of course, any animatronic skin without its contents is completely terrifying, and this one was no exception. Universe of Energy was peak Epcot entertainment when it opened, using an innovative ride system and a unique form of storytelling to educate guests on something that was, frankly, kind of boring. Despite how you might feel about this attraction, it set the tone for a new kind of ride that could surprise guests and keep them guessing. Pooh's Honey Hunt, Tokyo Disneyland After the theatrical release of The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh in 1977, Imagineers were determined to ride the popularity of the film. In the late 1980s, a plan was drafted to add a Winnie the Pooh attraction during the upcoming reimagining of Disneyland's Fantasyland. For unknown reasons, this never came to fruition, but the idea wasn't shelved for good. After the success of Who Framed Roger Rabbit, the attraction was set to be built in the eastern corner of the upcoming Toontown area. Guests would ride through the best scenes of the original film in honeypot vehicles that could be spun manually. This plan also fell through, though the ride concept was reworked into Roger Rabbit's cartoon spin, which was built on the site originally planned for Pooh. In the mid-1990s, during a resurgence in popularity, a Winnie the Pooh attraction was finally set to be built at Walt Disney World's Magic Kingdom. This decision wasn't without controversy, though, as the ride would replace the much-beloved Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. Meanwhile, over at Tokyo Disneyland, the park's Skyway attraction was closing and Imagineers were planning what to do with the available land once the stations were demolished. It was decided to build a unique Winnie the Pooh attraction on the site of the Fantasyland Skyway station. This ride would differ from the Magic Kingdom version in many ways, but most notably would be its use of a trackless ride system. On September 4, 2000, Pooh's Honey Hunt opened to park guests. It was immediately met with praise and large crowds, and to this day continues to be one of the most popular attractions at Tokyo Disneyland. 
The ride vehicles are shaped like honeypots, can hold up to five guests, and travel through the attraction together in groups of three. Upon boarding, guests watch a quick video of Christopher Robin giving Pooh a balloon. Making your way into the next room, you can see an immediate problem. It's a very blustery day, and the winds are causing issues throughout the 100-acre wood. Pooh is sent flying through the air, carried by the balloon. Kanga, Roo, Eeyore, Owl, Piglet, and Rabbit all struggle to stay on the ground, and Tigger bounces out from behind a bush. In the next room, a swarm of bees follows you in, trailed by Tigger. As Tigger begins to bounce and sing, the entire room and the ride vehicles bounce along with him. The honeypots move backwards through a hallway filled with branches, and Tigger can be seen clinging to one with a beehive stuck to his head. You then enter Pooh's house as he begins to drift off to sleep with his balloon at his side. The balloon begins to change into a heffalump's face. The room turns into a star field and Pooh floats away. Your vehicles make their way into a heffalump's and woozle's dream sequence, a brightly colored room with upbeat music and a dizzying ride path. You even come across a ride vehicle inhabited by a family of heffalumps and woozles. Making your way through the trunk of a heffalump, you come upon the honey tree. As the smell of honey fills the room, Winnie the Pooh eats handfuls of the treat and remarks how much he loves it. You make your way past a large storybook and exit the ride. Pooh's Honey Hunt uses a newer version of a trackless ride system, where instead of following a wire in the ground, it uses RFID to track its location. Because of the system, the ride computer can give each ride vehicle a unique path. It was something Disney Imagineering designed in-house and had patented themselves. The entire attraction had a budget of $130 million and it was well worth it. For unknown reasons, it's been the only Winnie the Pooh attraction that's used a trackless system, despite versions opening after Pooh's Honey Hunt.